Now please welcome back Bob Kuzak, who is joined by panelists Dan Gilson, CEO of the National Alliance on Mental Illness, Susan Gurley, Executive Director of the Anxiety and Depression Association of America, and Colorado State Senator Daphna Michelson Janay. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for being here. Uh, why don't we start off um, going down the line, Dan, starting with you, as far mm -hmm. as your uh, passion, why you're here, a little bit about your affiliation as well, and your group. Bob, I almost feel like I'm a moderator, too. Yeah, well, then take over, please. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, my passion. Um, but first of all, um, thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for hosting this, um, because this is a very important conversation, and we've got to change the narrative. Uh, who I represent is NAMI, the largest um, um, mental health organization, grassroots mental health organization in the United States with over 650 uh, organizations in communities across the, D, uh, across the U.S. So we're the DNA in the communities that uh, uh, Gabe spoke to, uh, a, a woman that reached out to him. Many of our people are volunteers in the communities that are doing that outreach. Um, nothing about us without us. Our community is a representative of lived experience, and that's where we start and often that's where we continue. Um, and um, uh, uh, in terms of our work and what brought me to this work is that um, I lost my contemporary. Um, we were to be the first to go to college. We were the role models for our younger siblings and uh, we grew up together. And um, she lived with a major depression. She was working, uh, gainfully employed, and she lost her life to suicide. I saw the ripple effect to what that did directly to uh, my family and um, the repercussions are still being felt, and that, that happened in 1986. So at this station of my life, it's an opportunity to give back and to make a difference, and that's what's brought me to this work. That's powerful. Daphne? Um, so I thank you very much for having me. Um, it's a little hard to tell my story. I wish I could say, do it as well as Gabe. He was pretty um, good, wasn't he? He was really good. <laughs> he was amazing. A round of applause for Gabe. Yeah, very nice. <laughs> <laughs> My son attempted suicide when he was nine years old, and he was in the fourth grade, um, and he had been talking about suicide since he was six years old, and wanting to die. He didn't know the word suicide, but wanting to die since he was six years old. And all of the doctors that I took him to said, don't worry, six-year-olds don't die by suicide, seven-year-olds don't die by suicide, eight-year-olds don't die by suicide. And when he was nine years old, he said, let me show you. And, you know, as a parent um, going through the process of helping my son through his mental health challenges um, and his mental health disorders, I realized and recognized, you know, there, there weren't services available. And even though I had great access, as a matter of fact, I worked at a hospital at the time that had a mm. children's um, unit and I couldn't get my son the help that he needed, um, I knew that there were more out there. And at the same time as I was trying to get my son the help he needed, which turned out to be part emotional and part educational, um, you know, there are two, two sides of a coin. He has, he's twice exceptional. Of course he's exceptional because he's my child. <laughs> um, but he's also exceptionally learning dis disabled. Um, so learning to find out about his his pathway, um, I was volunteering at two of our juvenile correctional facilities in Colorado, and one a boys facility and one's a girls facility. And I was working with the boys through Junior Achievement on a popcorn project, it was very exciting. And um, I realized the boys were just like my son. And I made a joke the next day to a friend, I'm looking at colleges for my daughter and prisons for my son. And I realized it wasn't very funny and I had to do something. And so I ran for office, and this is my major platform. And we'll come back to that, because I have some follow-ups on, on, on how you translate that into public policy. Uh, Susan. So I'm, I'm a lawyer um, by profession, and I've always been interested in social justice issues. And as many of you have spoken about, many people who are incarcerated and have issues suffer from mental illness. 
So I thought joining um, the Anxiety and Depression Association of America would be a wonderful opportunity for me to figure out how I could be part of the solution. And alas, as many of you have seen and discussed, um, there we haven't done enough to solve this issue. And I also wanted to just follow up on what Eli said and one of the things that we at ADA really talk about. I'm glad we used the word mental health, but mental health really is kind of a sexy term. It means everything and nothing. It's like buying a new dress. And we at ADAA talk about the specific disorders, anxiety, depression, OCD, PTSD, and co-occurring disorders. Because each of those means that you may need different therapy, different medication, different health. And I personally, and this is my personal opinion, feel that we feel so good about ourselves saying that we are talking about mental health. But by not really defining it, it makes it very easy not to do anything about it. So at ADAA, we are very committed um, to using words correctly. Um, I think that's really important. And ensuring that every patient has access. And then I'll stop with my other screed. And the biggest thing is there's not enough therapists. So here we have talked about we are destigmatizing and we are pro mental health. And then you finally realize, yes, I agree, I need help. And where do you go? Nowhere. So then you feel even worse about yourself. So thank you for talking about mental health and not ensuring that there's enough health care and access to care. So unless we do both, this conversation, in my opinion, is absolutely meaningless. Well, you definitely put your finger on a, on a major problem. How do, how, do we, how do we fix it? How do we address it? How do state and federal policymakers invest so that down the road, I mean, we're looking at major healthcare shortages uh, from a worker perspective that's only going to get worse at the current rate. Including people who should look like the patients they see. So if we improve the salaries, ensure there's maybe more debt relief and open up the schools and ensure that there's more social workers and therapists and give them, I don't know, we have enough money. We're one of the richest countries in the world. There's Harvard and Penn, they have more money than some countries in their endowments. Give more money in scholarships. Make that a priority for America to ensure that there's enough people trained in mental health. We say we have a war on drugs. Why don't we use that same resources and say we are going to use those resources and ensure that we have enough people who are trained to provide mental health services all through America? Why should I, privileged, live in Washington, D.C., have more access to more therapists than somebody who's living in a state in Utah, Puerto Rico, or wherever else? It's unfair or that there's not enough people of color who are therapists. Mm -hmm. Where are those people being able to serve? So I love being here. I'm glad we're talking about mental health, but I'm like, let's talk about nuts and bolts, resources. Resources, resources, resources. And then we can address the mental health crisis. As you can see, I'm on a screed. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a smart one. Daphne, what do you think about that? Um, well. I can tell you from my work in Colorado, from the Colorado perspective, um, I've been trying to answer that question. And one of, the, um, one of the challenges is how do we get people to the right level of care at the right place at the right time? Right now, we treat mental health like this. Say you go to the doctor and the doctor says you have high blood pressure. Mm -hmm. Give me a call when you have a heart attack. That's how we treat mental health. So, oh, you, you look a little bit down. Let me know when you're feeling suicidal, and I'll do a, a suicide assessment, and then, and then we'll try to find you a doctor, which is going to be impossible because you're in crisis, and it's hard to find anything when you're in crisis. Sure. So um, I put two laws into place. One is annual mental health wellness exams. We're the first state in the nation to require insurance companies to cover annual mental health wellness exams. 
and that is, has a large list, uh, a long list of mental health providers who qualify to give you an annual mental health wellness exam from a, um, a drug peer specialist to uh, marriage counselors to um, child psychiatrists. You know, you can pick who you want to go to for your annual mental health wellness exam. And you would just pay a copay? Zero copay and zero coinsurance. Zero copay, wow, very impressive. Okay. So it is a 45 to 60 minutes with a qualified mental health care provider for zero copay, zero coinsurance at any stage in your life, from the moment you're born till the moment you die. Hmm. So annual mental health wellness exams. Now we have to get the word out about them. Um, but if you, if you start checking in on an annual basis on your mental health, and you're checking in with a social worker, you're not pulling from the psychologists. You're not pulling from the psychiatrists. So if we have fewer psychologists and psychiatrists than we do have social workers, then the balance gives in and we have maybe enough people. The second law that I put into place was the imattercolorado.org um, program. And imatter Colorado is free therapy for any school-aged youth who wants it in Colorado, no matter where or if they go to school. So you go to imattercolorado.org as a teenager, and 12, year old, 12 years old is the age of consent in Colorado, so from 12 years old on, you can go onto this website and fill out a 16 questionnaire, 16 question questionnaire that will then come back to you and say, hey, we think you're doing great. Here are some coping skills um, and ways to continue doing great. Come back anytime. Two is we think you could really benefit from, from a therapist. Here is a list of all of our therapists and kid-friendly bios for you to select one of our therapists and, by the way, all their availability. So there's no waiting. And three, we think you're in crisis. We're connecting you to the crisis hotline now. So it's, it's three, three uh, comebacks when you fill out this um, form. And it is, we have served 8,500 youth in Colorado in a year. Um, 60 of the 64 counties were reached. And a part of that is because we're, it's, it's primarily telehealth. It's also in person. But it's also um, uh, in English and Spanish. Huh. So we have a lot of monolingual Spanish-speaking families in Colorado, and this is access to have therapy in your native language. Which is very important very as far important. as, um, and you, just as a quick follow-up, you said you've got to get the word out, right? Because you've got to tell people about it so they can take advantage of it. Right. How many people are taking advantage of it? I mean, obviously, that's, that's a big marketing campaign. That's got yeah, to so we, we ran the numbers, and our numbers did not increase between 21 and 22 in terms of people taking advantage of annual mental health wellness exams, the codes. So we pulled by the codes. Mm. Um, so we, we desperately need to get a public-facing um, public campaign out to let people know that this is an option and why it's important to take care of your mind like it is to take care of your body. Uh, no, that's great. Um, Dan, I want to talk to you about uh, your association recently launched a, a new teen and he, uh, young adult helpline. Can you tell us about that and, and, its, and its effect? Because that's what we spend a lot of this morning talking about, talking about I'm, uh, kids. Actually, yeah, I'm actually wearing a little bracelet for the helpline. Um, we say nothing about us without us, and we have a, a national helpline. And uh, one of the things about our helpline is before COVID, it was brick and mortar. It was tethered to uh, being in an office, and we had volunteers that we trained, but they would come in, volunteer uh, to actually um, be on the helpline. When COVID happened, we had to take it into the cloud. What has that allowed us to do is to actually train um, uh, uh, people across the country to actually work on the helpline. So we now are able to expand our reach and our services. The uh, teen uh, and young adult helpline is that, you know, we created, uh, uh, I heard David Trone, I think, speak about the next generation. Um, and what was interesting about that was that Representative uh, Trone, was that we've created a group called NextGen. Uh, and as we, as we looked at that, and this is a next-gen group of about uh, uh, 21 to 25 year olds, and, and, and I'm going to the teen helpline, but where I'm going with this is as follows. We created that to actually have nothing about us without us, and we knew that young adults needed to have a voice. And they said, don't patronize us, don't have us up on a dais, have us involved, have, have us at the table. So we put out 
Over 30 days, we put out an application process. We had 760 young people apply for 10 seats to work with us for a full year in forming our work going forward. And we've, we've done a great job with that. We took that and we asked that group, what are we not doing? And they said, you need to have the teen and young adult helpline. You need to have our voices. We actually had some callers call in and said, I don't want to. They could tell by your voice that you were, I guess you can say, in my age group. And they said, well, we, I want to talk to someone younger. So we got the feedback. We went back to the next gen group and validated, asked them. And then that's why we created it. And we just launched it last week. And we're very excited for what we know it's going to do for us. And it's directly from feedback from our next gen group. And for people watching, how can they get in touch? How, what's the number? How do they get in touch? Do they go to your website? They can go to our website, okay. NAMI.org, or 1-800-950-6264. Okay, very nice, very nice. I also want to follow up on what we were talking about earlier as far as kind of the breaking news that, that the Senate is going to follow the House's lead. That, that doesn't usually happen on a lot of things, especially on fiscal matters nowadays. But um, what do you know about that? Because I, I hear you were at, uh, you have some intelligence on this. Yes, yes. It's been in the works for a number of years and uh, really want to congratulate the, uh, the advocacy teams at, uh, at, at NAMI and uh, AFSP. And what I know about it is that it is a bipartisan uh, caucus group um, that um, um, uh, has four representatives, but it's actually been built out to 10 now, five. Democrat, five Republican, how they've come to that. It was launched on yesterday. Um, so yesterday morning was the press conference. Last night was the reception. And what was so interesting is the conversation about what mental illness does not look like. It doesn't look Republican. It doesn't look Democratic. It doesn't look independent. It looks like all of us um, uh, watching and all of us in the room. And the other, the, the biggest part of it for me was it was long in the works, and now what we see is a tone. I, I, I like to look at it as leadership, and thank you for your leadership, what you're doing, Senator. Leadership, tone, and execution. What I found was the tone and the temperament from these leaders is they are really all about execution, bipartisan execution. So, um, and they're getting to work right away. And what are their priorities gonna be in this Congress? Uh, first of all, the um, uh, first soundbite from Senator Padilla yesterday was about the safer, uh, the bipartisan Safer Communities Act and the implementation of it. Um, what he said was, when, and then also Senator Tillis said the same thing, before we look at new legislation, let's make sure we're doing something in terms of operationalizing that legislation that we have. Right. So that was the first piece. And then they're going to look at some new legislation in terms of uh, uh, some opportunities in communities. But the first part they want to do is seek first to understand what we already have and making sure that it gets implemented at the state level. Uh, Susan, we were talking a little bit uh, backstage on how words matter and of how people who have mental health conditions, uh, it's difficult, especially if they are, they're language barriers. Um, but also if the terminology is just not comprehensible uh, to them. What, what's, what's the key there? So thank you for asking that question. Um, ADA, we've worked very hard in ensuring that the, the language and the information we provide is health literate. Um, not everybody is as equally educated in this country and the information that we provide is for free. So we view ADA almost as an entry portal for people who are looking to learn more about mental health issues. So for example, we try to explain, you know, we throw these terms around therapists, CBT, ACT, all right. of these terms. Mm -hmm. Frankly, I don't know how many of you know all the terms that I forget them. I'm like, so we actually write it out and say, this is what it means and ask your therapist, what are the therapeutic models you are thinking about using? So we try to educate the consumer so that they feel comfortable when their providers use certain terminology. Or let's talk about medications. I'm a big proponent that if there are good medications out there, one should take them. But we try to also give the patient information and questions that they can ask in a way that they don't feel insulted in how we're putting them in words. Because as we know, the terms of these medications 
do, do any of you know what they mean? And then 500 different things that can cause you. We just want the patient to feel comfortable in saying, what does this new medication do? How does it impact other medications I may be taking? How does it impact the therapy that I am using? And just giving the consumer information in a way that is digestible so that they are not overwhelmed with jargon. And going back again, which we've all talked about, mental health, mental illness, people suffer from specific disorders. We have to use the names of the specific disorders to ensure that we provide the people who suffer with the right help. And that is critical, and that's why we're all here. But thank you for asking my no, favorite no, question. No, that's, I that's a very good, that's a very I'm good point. I'm sorry, I love that question, thank <laughs> you. Well, uh, I'm afraid we've run out of time. Please thank our panelists for joining us today. Hey, thanks, Dan.